Welcome to the Family Goals Podcast with Davey Pollock and Pastor Jay. My name is Joel and House, and the purpose of this podcast is to encourage you to grow closer to God, to strengthen your marriage, and to inspire your family to reach its highest potential. Today, we are continuing our conversation with Coach Mark Rick. So here's part two. Take a listen. You know, I guess yeah, it was last, it was, a, it was a calendar year ago, um, you know, inviting you to come to the golf tournament, and uh, I was talking to you about the golf tournament, and then you later uh not not too long afterwards you had to make a you made a big announcement right. to the world how right. how was your life well, how did you how did you determine you how did you make that announcement and right. and how is your life difference different since right. being diagnosed with parkinson's well doing a lot of uh speaking engagements and uh, i kind of knew i was my balance wasn't as good i knew my feet would start to freeze a little bit i knew my movement was getting slower and something was up and so I went to my primary care and he sent me to a neurologist. We took pictures of my brain and looked at him and he knew there was an issue from what he saw, but he didn't want to be the one to say, Dang. you got it. So he sent me to a specialist and we, we couldn't get an appointment until two months later. I mean, I could have tried to pull the coach Rick card, but I, I wasn't even in a hurry to go to that meeting. So we went to the specialist about two months later, by the time it was May 25th of last year. And by the time, uh, he said, you've got it. I, I pretty much knew I'd been reading about myself on the internet uh, with some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. So uh, by that time, I kind of knew what the deal was and decided to tell family members in private, uh, you know, one by one, my brother, my two sisters, my mom, my dad, they all live uh, in, in Athens. And so we, one by one, we went to everybody's house and told them. And then Catherine's family, we told over the phone. Was it, Were those meetings hard? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, everybody reacts differently. And a lot of people don't understand Parkinson's. And uh, it's really not a death sentence, uh, but it does change your life dramatically. It's a progressive disease that normally, uh, eventually, uh, takes away your ability to, to move. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you lose uh, your ability to do simple things like... Um, putting your clothes on or taking a shower or whatever it is. But, um, so anyway, uh, one by one we told everybody and then, you know, I'd, I'd go to these events and I, I really did. I'd be waddling around or my balance wouldn't be good or I just moved slower and everybody's like, coach, you okay? And I blamed it on a hip operation for a while. And then finally I said, I'm tired of, you know, be, be whatever and everybody. So, um, I just said, I'm going to let everybody know. And instead of telling them one by one, I just got on Twitter and, and I said, um, you know, I've got Parkinson's and uh, just want you to know that I look at it as a momentary light affliction compared to the glory that's coming. Thank you, mm -hmm. Jesus, for the promise of a glorified body at the rapture uh, that has no disease and has no sin in it. And, uh, and then I said, in the meantime, I'm going to be uh, thankful for what I have and enjoy the days that I, that I can. And, uh, so I kind of splattered it out there in the social media world. and um, But it, it was kind of uh, therapeutic for me to do that. Um, you just, I mean, I don't want to live a lie. I don't want to tell people stuff that's not true. And it was true that I did have hip surgery and all that. But, um, I mean, I'm not ashamed of having it. Uh, I've, I've got it. I mean, a lot of people have it. A lot of people have things that are worse than that. And um, so, um, you know, I guess the big thing for me is on that, on that regard is um, if all my hope was in things that are temporal, if, if my only hope was, is, was in what's going to happen on the earth, uh, I don't have a whole lot to look forward to, to be honest with you. When you become a prisoner in your own body one day, uh, that's not a whole lot of fun to think about. But when your hope is in e eternal things, when you know that, this glorified body's coming that you're going to chance you're going to get a chance to spend all of eternity in this new body with God uh, in heaven that gives me a great sense of hope so mm. you know my hope is in e eternal things not not temporal things and and the truth is uh, everybody everybody's body is not designed it was designed originally to live forever but after Adam's sin you know we all we're all going to die physically uh, of one thing or another so if our hope is in things on this earth, um, there's not as much hope as obviously is the hope 
of eternal life with, with Jesus. Amen. Amen to that. That's Well, you know, um, I felt that peace when I was about to die. And that, you know, the scriptures that come to life, you know, like when the Apostle Paul was talking about his, his momentary light afflictions. And so even with Parkinson's, I say, you know, when you say momentary, it could be 20 years. It could be 30 years that you're dealing with it. And you and it's you know and it's light in comparison to what we're about to get. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I've heard that scripture many many times, mm-hmm. but it, it, it really came to life once I had uh, the diagnosis of Parkinson's yeah. and started living it out. Yeah, like you know, just as we were getting prepared to get started, I I couldn't scoot my chair in by myself. <laughs> had to have David slide me in a little bit. So that's just part of part of my new normal. Let's talk a little bit about parenting. This is the Family Goals podcast. Do you Let's have do, it. do you have any advice for parents? Um, you know, I think sometimes we think, um, and I mentioned it earlier, the, the, our goal is to like give our children everything, <laughs> and uh, we we are uh, there to, you know, provide for them and take care of them. But I, I do think one of the greatest things that we can do for our children is have them prepared to, to fly on their own. And, uh, so, um, and the other thing is, you know, like with my son, John, you know, he was a football player and, uh, Prince Avenue, he, we, he was going to a faith based school, Prince Avenue Christian school. And that was very important to us for him to have that faith based education. And you can have, obviously you can go to a public school and, and teach your children about the Lord and there's no doubt about that. But, you know, the bottom line was football took a back seat to, um, to his education to the, and, and being at a faith based school for us. And so, um, the school was about to, uh, they just started football and, and I, I could have sent him to other schools that it maybe would have prepared him better for a football career, so to speak, or a scholarship and all that kind of thing. But it was more important for us to have him, you know, at Prince. And um, so I guess the point I'm trying to make is, you know, the goal is to get, get our children ready for life. And, you know, a lot of life is, is, is a struggle, and there's things that happen that we all know that are not easy to deal with. And if, if our kids don't have the ability to cope with a little bit of struggle, a little bit of pain, a little bit of adversity, or even a lot of bit of it, um, we're throwing them out there and when they're not ready. And, and I think when they're young, uh, you know, some people say, oh, you're sheltering your kid from the world. Like, yeah, I am. Until he's old enough to, you know, make wise decisions on his own. So I, I think it's okay to, to shield your children from the world. Some are like, oh, well, I'll let them decide when they're five what they want to be and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I think it's important to, you know, plow fertile soil for them to come to know Christ. And then, uh, and then, you know, once they get older, you start to let them experience more things in life, let them fail while they're in the home, where you can be there for them instead of protecting them all the way through high school. They go off to college and all these things start happening to them and they don't know how to cope and they do some stupid stuff that they weren't prepared for. And, you know, one last thing, when you start launching kids off to college, you know, me being the head coach of Georgia, we're dealing with college guys all the time Mm -hmm. and, you know, you get, you know, 18 year olds, 18 to 22 year olds with testosterone and girls, you know, stupid stuff happens. And, um, so I, I never hid stuff from my kids as they were getting a little bit older to say, you know, these are the things that are going to happen. You got to decide today what you're going to do when this comes up. Cause if you wait till, you know, it happens and you have no plan, you're going to probably make a bad decision. So I think you got to go through scenarios that are, that are going to come up in life and talk through them so when, when that thing happens, uh, they won't be caught off guard yeah, with it. They're prepared. That's great advice. So how, how many kids do you guys have? We've got four children. John's the oldest. Uh, he's 32 and um, got three beautiful children. Our grandchildren, Zoe, uh, or Jane, Zoe, and, and Champ, we call him, John Jr. But um, he's married to Anna. And then number two son is David. He's married to Joanna. They live in Nashville. They have two cats and a dog. And uh, 
And then uh, our son, Zach, lives in Orlando. We adopted him from Ukraine along with Anya, who we adopted from Ukraine. And uh, she's she lives in town. She's a vet tech. Hmm. Who was Anya's first love? By far, David. <laughs> Thank by you very much. By, by far. Thank you very much. Yeah, what? She, she was so heartbroken when David got married. She really thought she was going to marry David. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you about the, the adoption story because orphan care – is a big part of our church and, and we know that right. God loves and cares for orphans. Amen. We're all, we're all orphans. What, what led you guys to, uh, adopt? Well, we had, um, we were in Sunday school and we were talking about, you know, the church's role in taking care of the orphans and the widows. And, and one of the, uh, families, uh, in our Bible study, in our Sunday school class, uh, were, were a couple called the Tadlocks, excuse me, and they adopted two boys from Ukraine in Simperovful, the city near Kiev, not too far from Kiev, Kiev, however you want to pronounce it. And um, so then, as it turned out, my wife's brother and his wife were not able to have children biologically, so they decided to adopt two children um, from Ukraine, same orphanage. And so uh, while they were there, they were showing pictures and all that kind of thing. And they showed us a picture of a little boy. Um, like, hey, he'd be a great addition to your family. And uh, as it turned out, we, we started looking at that. And then there's another picture of Anya. And uh, we're like, uh, well, maybe we'll get a boy and a girl. So uh, we decided to, to just go off to Ukraine and <laughs> get a couple kids. And as it turned out, the boy that we thought we were going to get uh, was taken by somebody else, and then we ended up uh, getting Zach at that time. And it was Catherine who went by herself for three weeks prior to me getting there. I couldn't go that long because of my job. We were still at Florida State. And um, so you're talking about a leap of faith. Mm. Put your wife on an airplane to fly to Ukraine and stay there three weeks with people you've never – with people you've never met and, uh, and just feel like it's going to be okay. <laughs> I mean, thankfully there was interpreters that were there and, and people that had helped Catherine's brother and his wife and the Tadlocks that I mentioned earlier. So there was a little bit of comfort there, but at the moment of truth, I'm like, I don't know if we should do this. <laughs> you know, I felt like a bad husband, you know, sending her off, but we felt like, God was leading us to do it. And that, that's what it came down to mm. for us in all the def- decisions in our life is do we think God's saying to do it? Then do it. You know, like I talked to Catherine about decisions. She says, do you think that's what God wants you to do? I'm all in. If you, if you, are you doing it because you want fame or money or whatever? I'm out. You know, she just, that's how cut and dry it was. How do, how do, how do you, house. how have you figured out in your life of how to discern that? Like, I, I think a lot of people, right. a lot of people, I think I have a struggle of, okay, right. I can make this God's, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can sure. make this decision. How, well, how have you done it? Well, for us, um, Catherine and I, um, if we have a decision to make that we have time to mull over a week, a couple of days, a month, whatever it is, you know, you put it to prayer. And then uh, for me, especially, if I felt peace about a decision, you, know, you make a decision in your mind, and then if you have peace, then do it. If you make a decision in your mind and uh, you sleep on it and you don't have peace, then maybe it's not the right thing. That's was, was one of my gauges, but sometimes you got to make a decision now. Something comes up, you got to decide right that minute. And that's why it's so important to, you know, be in the word on a constant basis and be in a, in a way, in a position where when you do make a quick decision, it's a decision that God would be pleased with. Mm -hmm. Like I talked about before. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if you have time, we would pray and, and uh, hope to get to come to peace. And I'll say this, I've made decisions, and there's some decisions the next day you can you could change your mind, you know. You might make a decision, you live through it a little bit, and you're like, this is this was a bad decision. We got to, you know, swallow your pride and say, yeah. I made a bad decision. We're changing gears here, changing direction. But sometimes uh, you can't change the decision that you made, even though you might know it's a bad one, and then you just – you know, got to make the best of it at that point. So do your kids have any any relatives or connection with folks in the Ukraine now? 
No, it was interesting. We we talked to Anya just a little bit about what's going on in Ukraine, and she said, you know, I really don't have a, a connection there. There's there's no, not that she doesn't care for the Ukrainian people and know that she could be there, and who knows what would be happening. But uh, you know, she's she's an American. You know, she was two and a half years old when we got her, and we even tried. There was a librarian in town that actually spoke her language and we're like, Hey, we'll bring her there once a week and keep her language skills up. And the first day Catherine took Anya and Zach to meet this person. And that person began to speak in Russian or Ukrainian or whatever the language was. Uh, both kids like were clinging to Catherine's leg. Like, you know, don't, it was kind of like, don't send us back mm. uh, in their little minds. They, they, they was it bad association. It was bad association. And, so we just kind of nixed that idea and and didn't worry about it. But it, truthfully, um, Anya, the only recollection Anya and Zach have of Ukraine was the videos that we took in the orphanage when we first met them, and that was a probably a three minute video. Hmm. Well, talk about changing somebody's life. I can't think yeah. of any greater way other than someone coming to faith in Jesus, but Amen. to take someone who's an orphan in another country and then giving them a home and and a roof over their head and and the love and the support and right well i'll I'll say this real quick um the adoption is is a little bit like a wedding a a marriage in that there's there's the wedding day and that's a celebration and everybody's fired up and everybody's like oh this is awesome and then after the after this after the Ceremony, After the ceremony, and, then then you got the rest of your life to live, and so then you have the marriage after the after the wedding, and so it's a little bit like that in is in, in adoption. You you have that day where you where you bring them home, and everybody's like, "Oh, you guys are awesome! This is so great!" And everybody celebrates it. But then you got to you know you got to live out that decision for the rest of their lives and your life too. And and the truth of the matter is. Um, you know, adoptive children usually have different issues than children that are born in your home and get the nurturing that they need. Uh, a lot of these kids in these orphanages uh, get uh, very inconsistent care and sometimes no care at all, and so they they struggle. So, um, you know, a lot of times you think as an adoptive parent, we, we all we need to do is love these kids, uh, and everything's going to be okay. And uh, there's a book called, uh, it's called, uh, oh gosh, Nancy Thomas wrote it. When, oh, When Love Is Not Enough. Hmm. It's called When Love Is Not Enough. And it has a lot to do with children from, you know, European countries that were in orphan, orphanages. And uh, you learn that uh, sometimes they'll get a thing called reactive attachment disorder where, they uh, they detach a little bit from humans because of the lack of care that they get when they're babies. I mean, our our grandson Champ has probably been held more and looked in his eyes and and sang to and prayed for uh, in his short three months than they did in their first three years of life. Mm-hmm. So, um, um, you know, that's just. I think adoption is aw- awesome. We would never change it, but if we were more educated as to that what was coming up, it it helps. So, you know, I just have, would say, if God says do it, do it. But but educate yourself the best you can, and and uh, maybe uh, do just do a better job of parenting children that are have to be handled just a little bit differently. Well, it's about like marriage, like you said. I like that because <clears throat> marriage, we think we got it all figured out too. We read some books, and then. 10 years down the road, you're like, golly, I wish I could have done that a little bit different. Like if I'd have known, if I'd have known this, correct. but talk about, cause we've talked about this in study, but talk about, you know, the troubles too, that that also brings with your marriage and, and how right. you have to keep your marriage. How do you keep your marriage? Cause I think what I've right. seen a lot with my friends and the, a lot of the struggles with my friends is the kids become first. That's, that's, the, the kids go there. And as soon as that happens, it's hard to go back. Right. And I've seen it. As well, you destroy you're, marriages. You're 100% right. And, uh, you know, the, the children live in our world. We don't live in their world. And I'm talking about parents. Uh, the, we, we, uh, we are in charge. Hmm. And that's, 
the bottom line. And one thing that uh, I would not uh, tolerate at all, zero tolerance was disrespect, uh, especially uh, for mom. You know, if they no, not many try to disrespect me, you know, because I had the hammer. But and Catherine had a pretty good hammer too. But um, <clears throat> if there was any disrespect towards their mother, that got nipped in the bud. And the bottom line is, uh, <clears throat> their cell phone's not their cell phone. It's our cell phone. We let them use it. You know, if you get them to the point where they're going to drive around in the car, it's not their car. It's our car. I, I tell them, this is my car, and I'm going to let you use it. You know. Maybe one day you can earn the money to buy a car, or we may give gift you a car at some time in your life. Maybe, you know. But the bottom line is, uh, this is this is our stuff, and we're we're just letting you borrow it. And if you want to if you want to continue to borrow it or use it, you have to live you have to you know live by the rules of the house. If you disrespect your mom, guess what? You don't get your phone for a week or whatever it is. I mean. You, you can't be afraid to discipline your children because if, if you are, then uh, they'll run you over. I mean, bottom line is the older they get, the more they think they're in charge, and, and, they're, not, and they're not. And when you give boundaries to children, um, they may act like they don't like it, but it gives them security. It helps mm-hmm. them understand that they're safe. And uh, when you don't give them boundaries or you let them do whatever they feel like doing, even if you think it's not in their best interest, then more than likely – it's not going to end well. And, uh, you know, you do have to give them responsibility and uh, chances to make mistakes, like I said earlier. But on the other hand, you can't, you can't let them be in charge of the house. Great advice. I think cell phones are Satan's best toy yet. Well, I mean, you're, you're, we, gave, we gave phones that you could text and call, period. There's no internet on their phone. There's gab phone. They, they, that's a, that's a, we that's what we'd have. Gab. It's called a gab phone. Gab now. phone. No we call, apps. We, we, we no call internet. Them, we call them d- dumb phones. That's a, that's that's what the kids make fun of Nicholas, my son. That's yeah. they call it a dumb phone. That's what they that's what they got. I mean, if you put the internet in the hand of a kid of a teenager, you you know what he's going to see. You know what she's going to see. It's going to be some pretty cool stuff, and it's going to be some pretty horrible stuff that you can't erase from your brain. You just made your life as a parent twice as hard. Maybe maybe and, ten and times you may, as hard. And you, may, and you made their life a lifetime of of, uh, of issues that didn't have to happen. Um, if you just you know you and you know you get that peer. Oh well, my my friend got it at age thirteen, or my friend got it at age fourteen, or whatever. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. That's their parent, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but this is how we're going to do it. Mm. So like it or not, that's, that's what's up. <laughs> so you're, you're a little older now, coach. Yeah. So, and you're a little bit removed from parenting. 13 and 14 is late. Yeah. Like, bro, it's crazy. Yeah. I'm I, sure. I have neighbors and friends, like good friends that you're talking about third grade. Yeah. Third grade having an iPhone. Yeah. I'm like, wowzers. That's yeah. crazy. It's nuts. Just think of the worst thing that could ever be seen on the internet and then just say that and just know that's what your kid's going to see. That's what they're mm. going to see. And they don't have to be looking for it. It'll find them. It'll find them. It'll come to them. We had a guy share in our men's discipleship the other night that that he looked at pornography when he was around 15 years old, maybe on the phone, who knows, internet, but he's been addicted for 19 years, and he's finally finding some freedom through joining the men's group and having accountability and understanding God's grace and forgiveness. That's, and but, that's that's the thing about, you know, our body and our brain. I mean, our brain that it never gets erased from our brain. And uh, so we're, even though we're believers, we still sin because we have those sin habits in our brain that don't go away. And uh, Satan uses those to, to jack us up and try to make us fall. If I and, ask you to draw a diagram, I bet you could draw a diagram of exactly right. what you're talking about. That's true. We I mean, just did a study in Romans. Roman study. What, Bob, it was your buddy. Bob Warren. Bob Warren. It was so awesome but he has these diagrams and talks about flesh and it shows you you know your fleshy brain uh like that it's still that's your sin your flesh is still there your your thought process is still there we've learned a lot about that that's yeah i mean it's been important you know whatever gets put in there just doesn't go away so if at 15 he sees something that's not going away and that's why he's been dealing with it i mean for me i'm i'm walking down from the school bus to my house and there's a there's a box of Playboy magazines that some guy 
was thrown out in his trash. Well, guess who picked it up? You know, those, those images don't go away. And so, you know, but the beauty is, you know, again, talking about, you know, when we become believers at the point of justification, when we, when we pray to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, our spirit and soul become perfect. And that's how God sees us. Now, our behavior lags behind because we're still in this flesh. We still have these brains that have these bad memories and, and bad sin habits that, that crop up. But we're, we're saints who sometimes sin. We're not, we're not low-down sinners anymore. We're, we're saved by the grace of Jesus. And the only thing that hadn't changed yet is ejecting out of these bodies and getting that new glorified body we talked about that will match the spirit and soul that were made perfect in Christ as we believed. Um, and that's when that's called glorification. And that's, that's what I look forward to. I know that's what I look forward to. Coach, I want to thank you for pouring into David and these, these younger men. And David talks about you all the time and the impact that you've had. And we talked a couple of weeks ago that everybody needs a apostle Paul in their life. Everybody needs somebody who's a spiritual leader right. they can look up to. And David and so many people look up to you and, Appreciate you because you could very easily, you're retired. Right. You've had a great impact. You adopted children. Um, you could very easily, uh, you're, you're battling Parkinson's. You've right. had a heart attack. It'd be very easy to say, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to coast we the We didn't rest say it was easy, day. right? But you're still pouring into, yeah. you're still, God's got you here and he's using you. Yeah, and, well, you and re- you're being available. I, I retired from coaching, but not, not from life. And, um, you know, my my motivation uh, is to preach Christ. I mean, when people get to the moment of truth, I want them to know where they're going. I want them to have peace. I want them. To, I want to see them in heaven. And uh, you know, we we worry too much about things on the earth. Um, and it's easy for me to say because I'm 62, and you know, I'm having that heart attack after having a full full life, and I'm ready to go. I mean, if I'm if I'm 22 having a heart attack, I'm probably you know, scared to death and thinking I didn't live enough life. But um, but the older you get, the more you understand that it's only going to last so long for everybody. Pablo Lopez, it happened one night in his early 20s. Never never dreamed it would have happened, you know. So we don't know when it's going to happen. So be, be prepared for that moment. And a lot of people are like, well, I'm going to check my faith at the door. And then after college, then I'll, then I'll become a believer. I mean, you just don't know if you have that much time. And, and the bottom line is, again, when it comes to the very end, one thing matters, and that's where you're going. And Because you, you're going somewhere forever. Face it, you know. Mm-hmm. I think I think I'd choose heaven over hell, that's for sure. <laughs> I, did, I did choose that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I love, too, the whole conversation. I don't know if you noticed this, Davey, but Coach Rick has turned the conversation to Jesus. No matter what we're talking about, it's all about Jesus and the hope that we have in heaven. That's that's inspirational. So. It is for me. <laughs> no doubt. We appreciate having you, Coach. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for having me, man. This, this was a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Family Goals with Davey Pollock and Pastor Jay. Thank you again for listening to this week's Family Goals podcast with Davey Pollock and Pastor Jay. One big thing that stuck out to me was Coach Rick calling his Parkinson's disease a momentary light affliction and that his hope is not in this life, but in the next. Most people don't feel peace when they think about dying, but Coach Rick does have that peace because he knows where he's going after death. So for everyone listening right now, do you have peace when you think about death? Do you know where you're going after you leave this earth? If you don't know or have questions, we encourage you to reach out to someone around you, or you can email me at jolan at Thank you again for tuning in, and we'll catch you next week.